I use exploding stars to measure how fast the universe is expanding today. This is one type of star which people may have heard of. It's called a supernova of type 1A by seeing their apparent brightness and comparing it to this characteristic brightness. You can then infer a distance. That distance along with other information gives us the expansion rate of the universe. Another thing that I'm quite excited about is using supernovae in a completely different way, which is through the phenomenon of strong lensing, which is similar to how optical lensing happens, but lensing by a massive gravitational object. The difference in the arrival time with the different images is characteristic of the expansion of the universe. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Physics Chat. Physics Chat is a show where we talk to real life scientists and ask them what it's like to be a modern day physicist. We chat about everything from their hobbies, their life experiences, to how they are trying to understand some of the strange phenomena that occur in our universe. But you know, I could not do this alone. So I'm here with Dan and Joe. Today we have such an incredible guest, Nikki. Nikki is a postdoc at Stockholm University. Hello, Nikki. How are you doing? Hello, I'm good. We're finally having some sun here in Sweden. How are you guys doing? Oh, I'm doing well, thank you. So tell me, how is life in Sweden? It's amazing, really. The nature here is just incredible. And especially for someone like me coming from the Netherlands, it's very impressive. And there's so many fun activities that you can do here, like hiking. We go on lo really long hikes and you can just camp anywhere in the forest and have your own barbecue, outdoor climbing. I'm doing some painting. And then in winter, you can do other things like cross-country skiing and ice swimming. Wow, it's amazing. What a range of stuff. The um, cold water swimming sounds pretty intense. Can you tell us a bit more about that, why you enjoy it? <laughs> yeah, maybe it's not the most appealing thing ever, but it's really cool because it gives you this emotional reset. So if you're feeling a bit low on energy and like a zombie, which can happen in Sweden in the winter with the dark days, and then you go into the water, your body gets into survival mode, and then afterwards you feel super refreshed and happy. How is it? <laughs> a bit colder than uh, yesterday. Okay, that is not my idea of enjoyment. But anyway, I do love painting. So what sort of things are you painting at the moment? I'm mostly doing watercolor paintings of like lots of random stuff about nature, um, also some portraits. And I also like to combine it with my research. So I can make some paintings for posters at conferences or use the videos in my presentations. Wow, that sounds amazing. So how did you get into astronomy then? So when I had to choose what to study, this was just really the coolest topic out there. And so I picked astronomy and then did my bachelor and master in Groningen in the Netherlands. And then I moved to Copenhagen to do my PhD. And now I'm doing a postdoc in Stockholm. Amazing. And can you, as we start looking maybe at the science, um, so can you give us a brief overview of what it is your research? I'm looking at different ways to measure the expansion rate of the universe. And currently, there's some uncertainty about what this value is that makes us question everything we know about the universe. So I was trying to look into some new models. And then recently, I'm focusing more on gravitationally lens supernovae to measure this expansion rate. Fascinating. So um, yeah, in the previous episode, we have talked uh, in depth about supernovae and the expansion rate of the universe. Um, but just for now, could you give us a really quick explanation of what a supernova actually is? It's an exploding star at the end of its life that is very bright, so we can see it out to large distances in the universe. So yes, and so the difference, I think, with today's episode is you're talking about gravitational lensing. Dan is our uh, gravitational lensing expert in the group, and we've done a video with him before, but could you also explain, what, again, what that is and how you use it in your research? So light can be deflected by mass, and very massive objects in the universe, like stars and black holes, can act like lenses in that way. Even so that um, if you have light rays going in multiple directions, they can be bent and focused towards us. So we can see multiple images of the same object. And this phenomenon was already predicted by Albert Einstein. And then later Fritz Wicke predicted that not only compact objects like stars and black holes, but even entire galaxies can act like lenses in that way. And then Shurevsal predicted that if you have such a lens galaxy with a supernova behind it, you can see the multiple images of the supernova and use that to calculate the expansion rate of the universe. So for me and my research, I'm trying to look for these gravitationally lensed supernovae. Okay, now it's time for my random question. And it is very random. What is your craziest fire story? Maybe that I once warmed my hands on a burning human. So we were in India um, and it was raining and the tractor driver suggested a really nice place to shelter for the rain. 
which turned out to be a cremation ceremony. So we were just standing there surrounded by cows, warming our hands. And then at some point it's all just like, oh, you have to step back a little bit because the brains are going to explode in a second. Wow. <laughs> I don't think anyone can beat that one. Um, Joe and Dan, do you have any crazy fire stories? Not of that <laughs> caliber. No. I was going to say, whatever I say, just isn't going to be anything. I agree well, with you. That is a very crazy fire story. Yeah. Um. Away from the exploding brains onto exploding stars again. Um. Specifically, gravitationally lens supernovae. How common actually are they in our universe? They're very rare. You have to be quite lucky to have this configuration right, where you have the lens galaxy with behind it a supernova. Uh, so we expect that only 0.1% of all supernovae will be lensed. We found six lens supernovae so far. Uh, supernova Requiem, 16 GEU, Revstal, 2022 RIV, um, a lens supernova in the Abel cluster. And last year, we also discovered one with the team in Stockholm, Supernova Zwicky. Oh, cool. So you were part of the team that discovered that, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Oh, nice. And how did you, how does that, how does that happen? How do you discover a lens supernova then? So we use this wiki transient facility, which is a telescope that scans the entire northern sky and looks for new objects that appear in the sky, which are transients. And one of these objects are type 1a supernovae, and these are supernova explosions that always have approximately the same brightness. But last year we discovered one that was 25 times as bright as they normally are. So we knew that the only explanation was that it had to be gravitationally lensed to be so magnified. And this object we then called supernova Zwicky. That's really fascinating. Um, it's not very often we get to talk about an object in astronomy where you can name every one of that object in this video. Um, <laughs> uh, so it's it's kind of, I guess, the astronomer's dream to like discover a new object. So what did that actually feel like, especially for something so rare and exciting like a lens supernova? It was, yeah, it was really special. I mean, I'd been working on simulations only before then and sort of made my peace that I might never discover a real one. <laughs> so actually doing that was so special. At the same time, it was also a bit stressful because we had to be quick to get more observations of supernova Zwicky before it would fade away. Could you tell me how long it takes for a supernova to fade away or dim down? It depends a bit on the type, but for supernova Zwicky, we had around like a month or a bit longer. Like it's quite lucky that you managed to see it. So yeah. can you tell us a bit more about the um, ZTF and the telescope you used to discover this? Yeah, this is a telescope facility in California. So the, it has one of the telescopes that is looking for new objects. And then also on the side, it has another larger telescope that then gets a spectrum to do the classification. But just to point out that I don't actually go there. We get all the data in Stockholm, so we don't really have to travel there. I had a similar experience with observing with um, Desi earlier this month, getting excited about going to the States and then staying up until seven in the morning doing observations. So I know what it feels like. Um, are there <laughs> any other cool telescopes you've used or anything? Yes, definitely, because the Zwicky Transient Facility, it has a very wide field of view, so it can discover a lot of new objects, but it's not good for looking at a small object in detail. And then we had to apply for time at larger telescopes to do that, like the Very Large Telescope in Chile and the Keck Telescope in Hawaii. So we used Keck, um, which shoots out a laser to correct for the distortions in the atmosphere. And that resulted in this image over here, which was the first time that we could actually see all the separate images of Supernova Zwicky. So by correcting for the distortions in the atmosphere, you can get really sharp observations from Earth. But after that, we also had observations with the Hubble Space Telescope. Wow, amazing. This is all obviously really cutting edge stuff. So begs the question, what does the future look like for uh, gravitationally lensed supernovae? I would say the future is very bright because <laughs> there are so many new amazing telescopes. The James Webb Space Telescope has already been launched and is looking at galaxy clusters and thereby just randomly by chance discovering new gravitationally lensed supernovae. There's also currently a telescope being built in Chile, the Vera Rubin Observatory, and this will be operational within a few years. And it's a sort of a new and improved version of the Zwicky Transient Facility. And it will scan the entire southern sky while looking much deeper into the universe. So predictions are that the Vera Rubin Observatory can discover several hundreds of lens supernovae a year, which is really exciting. Okay, so Supernova Zwicky is this brand new object. Is there anything special about it? Yeah, the most special thing is that it's incredibly small. So this image was really at the limit of what our telescopes could resolve. Does that mean we can still measure the expansion rate of the universe, or is that a problem? No, it's completely useless, because to measure the expansion rate of the universe, you need to have uh, to measure the time delays between the appearances of the multiple images. And you can see already here that they're pretty much simultaneously. 
So that means that we cannot get a precise measurement of the expansion rate of the universe, unfortunately. That's a little sad. Yeah. Well, but is there, is there anything you can do with Zwicky? Yes, it's still interesting because we can use it to learn more about the properties of the Lens galaxy, which is also a very light Lens galaxy, which is very special. And also by using the different images, we can learn more about the substructure and the dark matter at the position of those images. That's amazing. Yeah. Wow. Oh, no. <laughs> Wow, thank you so much for being on Physics Chat. It's been so interesting hearing about Supernova Zwicky and the fact that Supernova can get strongly lensed too. Let us know in the comments section if you have any crazy fire stories. I wonder if you can beat Nikki's crazy fire story when she was traveling in India. We would love to hear from you, so keep writing. But from everyone at Field of View, we hope you have a great day and goodbye. Bye. 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 <laughs>